Financial expert John Butler tells us that the U.S. deficit spending is only seen in times of extreme recession periods, but yet we're not seeing the recession show up yet. But it might be right around the corner because he says that this is unsustainable and that it will happen. And when it does, it won't be good. Hey, John, thanks so much for joining our show. I'm excited to learn from you today. You've been serving the global financial industry for a long time, more than 25 years experience, and you've worked for European and U.S. investment banks, and you were the managing director and head of index strategies group at Deutsche Bank in London. And most notably for me, and this is prior to the GFC, you were managing director and head of European interest rate strategy at Lehman Brothers in London. There you were voted number one in institutional investor research survey. And I, I could just continue. Your resume is so impressive. I could just go on and on and on. Uh, but uh, John, did I get that right? Well, yes, those those things are all are all in my past, as it were. Um, I, I used to work for very large financial institutions, but as the years went on, I kind of grew increasingly frustrated with the direction of the industry. And indeed, I'm proud to say that I uh, walked out uh, in August 2008, having had enough and took a year off to contemplate uh, how I would set, set up shop to start working independently uh, from then on. So tell us what you're doing now. Well, now I'm the investment director for London-based South Bank Investment Research. We're the UK's largest independent investment consultancy. We provide investment services looking at a broad range of markets with a UK focus, and yet actually a number of, uh, of, our, of our services do have an international angle, which would also include uh, the US markets, stocks, bonds, and so forth. Well, we're connected globally now more than ever yeah. and uh so yeah but you talk a lot about real estate you know obviously i'm a real estate broker here in the states the U united states and uh but you talk about not just u.s related uh topics and i've heard you speak on commercial real estate which i want to dive into a little bit here today uh but you also cover a lot of the global economy and i have a lot of questions for you so you're interviewed a lot, but I'd like to start off with asking, is there anything that's happened globally, things that may affect us here in the U.S. that, you know, most recently that you haven't covered in any other interviews? Well, I mean, it seems that, uh, as Lenin said, right, there are there are decades uh, or we, uh, we, decades that, that seem like weeks. That is so much stuff happens so fast. History speeds up. And I think that's true right now. That is, every day brings a set of headlines that you could barely have imagined five or 10 years ago, right? And, and, and I'd like to say that that would be you know, good news headlines, but it's kind of the opposite. Uh, the world's kind of coming apart. And, and it seems that every day you see one more reason to be very concerned about the state of things. And I'm, I'm the father of four children, and you can imagine how that makes me feel because I feel terribly responsible uh, for the future, as it were. Uh, and I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do about it. <laughs> yeah, not sure that we can do anything about it. We're just watching it happen. Uh, you may have, though, a little bit of inside track or can see things that are coming a lot more than just... What I, what I, what I see, what I see uh, is that there is an increasing sense of exasperation and desperation amongst the people who thought they were sort of in charge of what was going on. And I think that's true in a lot of countries. And I think it's true also at the international level. That is, I think the, uh, the it's not business as usual at the United Nations. It's not business as usual when the G7 get together. It's not business as usual in a lot of bilateral diplomatic uh, relationships, which are necessarily changing as the balance of power of the international system shifts. And by balance of power, I mean, it, in literally all aspects, military, economic, political, even cultural, perhaps in some ways, because of what's happened uh, with, uh, oh gosh, call it whatever you want, woke culture uh, sort of battles and whatnot uh, in, in recent years. 
So all, all of that is shifting so fast now. I get a sense that the people who thought they were in charge had some sense of how to guide things and hold things together and direct them in the way they wanted to. They're, they're really flailing around now, which is, I don't know, maybe that's how history works, but it's a frightening prospect in the moment. Do you think a lot of that, I mean, if you had to put your finger on one thing, uh, because, I mean, we're talking about PhD economists that are running countries, especially here in the U.S., I mean, our Federal Reserve System, or just central banks all around the world. They're smart people. I mean, this isn't, I mean, do you think it's, um, are we talking about something that is a greater plan that is unraveling? Or are we talking about bad mistakes, not looking at back at history so much? I mean, I, it doesn't take much to realize that the, when we went through the global financial crisis, which was massive in 2008, almost a decade long, I mean, are, we're not learning. It doesn't appear that we're learning anything from history. What do you think is really behind it all? Is it just a, that they're just they're too book smart and they didn't realize what all of these negative implications would be financially? I think pretty much everything you said is part of the explanation. I don't think there's a single one, you know, cause to it all. And and I and I think the I think the Greeks kind of understood that. If you've if you've read Greek literature, that is the dramas, and if you've read some Greek history, you have you you, you gain this sense that the Greeks understood that history did move in cycles, but that those cycles were multi-dimensional. They did not occur along just one dimension. And and I believe that that's very important for us to consider today. So, for example, you have people in power. Uh, they're always you know, so, someone's always in charge, at least to some extent. But as we know, power tends to corrupt. You have you have people in charge of central banks and other regulatory institutions with academic backgrounds. And as we know, if you spend your life in an ivory tower, you tend to lose touch with what actually happens in the real world. And and so you've got you know a, li a little of that. You've also got just general confusion. I, I I think that you've had such a long period of oh gosh, shall we call it Pax Americana, where everybody took the structure of the international system for granted. That you you've gone through you know several generations of that now, and there's really no one around anymore who understands that in fact something that's far more normal in the world is that there is no one presiding great power. There's a rather multipolarity is the historical norm. Even when Britain controlled a third of the world roughly under the British Empire, a lot of that control was very tenuous and was really only in the littorals of the world, that is areas uh, that had shorelines where the British Navy was able to support uh, and enforce British rule. So even even then, right, uh, you know, Britain nominally controlled a third of the world, but in reality, it was maybe a sixth of the world, say. So that that's more the norm. And yet we came we became accustomed to the to the U.S. having a hand in everything. And as the years have gone by and as a number of other countries have grown in relative power vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., be it economic political, military, you name it, um, that's been shifting in the background. But in the same way Mac Malcolm Gladwell popularized the concept of a tipping point, you only really notice that these shifts have been occurring when it begins to tip. And we're there now. I, I think we're there now. And I think that's why so many people are so surprised at the pace of what's going on. Yeah, I love Gladwell's books. What a, a great writer. And there's <laughs> there is a lot of uh, insight to the tipping point. I believe that there is wisdom in crowds and you can sort of tell when everybody, you know, seems to be, I guess now distrusting what's happening. And I think that's, you know, I don't here in the U S I don't think it really matters which side you're on. I think there's a lot of um, skepticism on, I think everybody here is realizing, and I'm sure it's the same uh, where you are, but uh I mean, affordability is getting horrible. And for everyday people, consumers, uh, we're seeing debt explode like we never have before. Uh, my industry, the housing market, I mean, prices are ridiculous. They, I mean, we're seeing in some areas, some markets uh, where you need eight or nine times median income to buy a house. And that certainly has us in uh, in a little bit of a crisis. And over the last decade or so, with interest rates below 4% mortgage rates, 
A lot of people are being really hesitant to give those rates up. Um, going, I mean, being in the markets prior to the GFC, are you seeing some, I mean, obviously we have bubbles everywhere, whether you're talking about, you know, the stock market or uh, debt bubble or the deficit spending bubble that we're in right now, but housing, uh, the housing bubble, and I know that's not really your, uh, your expertise, but how I really see you uh, analyzing what's going on in, in the housing sector is that you were around when we really, and, and with all of your investor relations, you were around when we fed during the Obama administration here in the U.S., we fed our foreclosures and our defaulting residential housing market to Wall Street. And uh, I mean, for at one point prior to that, they were buying multifamily buildings, apartment complexes. Uh, they were never in single family residential housing. So now that this is all inflating, do you see where we could be heading towards another residential market crash? Oh, I think that's certainly possible when you look at the numbers, right? When you step back and look at the big picture. Now, I have essentially zero practical pound the pavement real estate knowledge or experience. However, uh, from a theoretical point of view, I've actually studied uh, real estate quite extensively as a as a as a as a macro phenomenon. So you know, very very top down, and and indeed, it's that background which allowed me to see some warning signs in the mid two thousands that the U.S. housing market was really bubbling up. And indeed, I went I went to school with some with some people. I'm from California originally, and I went to school with some people in the Bay Area who went into the real estate market in California and did very well for themselves. And, and we were, you know, we, we stayed in touch through the years. And in the mid 2000s, they started to talk about these valuations that were so outrageous. And and you ran the numbers, and you know the the uh, the, um, the the California housing bubble, which I'll extend to the U.S. in a moment. But the California housing bubble, by you know whenever it was 2005 2006, basically meant that the state of California was worth more in real estate terms than the entire country of Japan, which which. Is, is kind of hard to believe. But then you can reverse that because at the height of the Japan, Japanese bubble <laughs> in the late 1980s, the city of Tokyo was worth more than the state of California. <laughs> so, you know, these, these crazy things can happen. What makes that possible? Real estate is a strange market because it's both incredibly value, valuable and yet incredibly liquidity directional at the same time. What I mean is it's a liquid market when prices are rising because the, the, the property is the collateral itself behind the loans. It's all financed with secured lending. But that means that the moment prices stop rising, they don't even need to outright fall. The moment they stop rising, liquidity can evaporate very, very quickly. And so historically, we've always said, oh, you know, home prices don't crash at a nationwide level. That became not the case anymore in the in the 2000s because the Fed so goosed the economy with low interest rates, it inflated housing prices across the country. And when interest rates finally had to rise because the economy was beginning to overheat, the property bubble burst and you didn't see that diversification at the national level. It all came crashing down. Uh, again, a similar thing happened in Japan in the late 80s, early 90s. And so that could all happen again for the exact same reasons. I mean, look, you know, history repeats. It doesn't rhyme. That's true of financial history, monetary history, real estate history, you name it. But we are set up now for something not dissimilar, at least in magnitude, if not in specifics, to what happened in 2008, 2009. But as you say, the structure of the market has changed. The ownership structure of the market has changed. Uh, you've, you've seen the growth of a rental culture and the single family home ownership culture being diluted. I actually talk about that in the first section of my, of my book, The Golden Revolution Revisited. That when you get into this sort of environment where there are bailouts for financial intermediaries and those bailouts are ultimately financed through some combination of inflation and taxation, that results in a net transfer of wealth from the typical household to the financial intermediaries. That's exactly what has happened. And that is a, that results in a general increase in inequality 
and therefore a general decrease in affordability for a typical family to own a home. That's where we are now. And sadly, uh, if we get into a pickle again, and they just throw more bailout money at the problem again, it's only going to get worse in the future. Well, that leads me right into the bailouts because, <laughs> because that seems to be the way that we've been handling this. I mean, I want to talk about the money supply, uh, but before we get there, uh, do we learn, has history taught us anything about bailouts? I mean, are bailouts, do you believe in them? Is this something that's sort of new uh, to our macroeconomics? Because it seems like, you know, here in the United States, we have been bailing out. I mean, since COVID, obviously, we printed a lot of money uh, in two years, more than we printed in 200 years. Uh, we watched inflation go through the roof. A lot of that was due to supply issues, but a lot of it was stimulus, mm -hmm. you know, uh, providing stimulus to companies, providing stimulus to households, uh, incentivizing people to with uh, more unemployment, federal unemployment on top of state unemployment so that they were making actually more money in a lot of cases than they did at their job uh, when they were working. And we've we've sort of ha we've sort of gotten into this now um, pattern of preventing foreclosures, and I get it. I mean, this is it's a touchy subject with our homeless uh, population growing. It seems more and more every day. Adding people to the streets not necessarily a, a favorite thing to do, but people commit to these loans. They commit to they sign contracts. They they sign uh, loan agreements. But now we're bailing out student debt there have been people that haven't been paying their mortgage payments their their remodifications have taken a lot of their principal balance and cast it on the back reducing their monthly payments a lot what has has this been done before in history is this new and what does that how does that end up uh, look, bailouts go way, way back, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to provide a history lesson here. But let's just say that um, various forms of bailouts have taken place from time to time, and they boil down to basically political reasons. Uh, that is, that for whatever reason, the power structure of that particular country, that society, was such that it was possible for those who got into trouble to effectively seize the assets. That's always done through sleight of hand of some kind, but to effectively seize the assets of others in order to make themselves whole. However, in modern times, we in the United States have gone through this iterative process. And let's begin with the early 1980s. Paul Volcker has raised interest rates to a very, very high level to try and uh, break the stagflation of the 1970s. Uh, he knows he knows he's going to cause a big recession by doing this, but he wants to restore confidence in the dollar. He wants to bring inflation down. He wants to kind of clear the decks, as it were, so that some of the pro-growth supply side policies being implemented by the Reagan administration will eventually be given a chance to work properly. And, and, uh, and arguably, you could say, eventually, they do begin to, to uh, improve uh, the economy somewhat. Um, okay, but at the height of that, in I believe it finally goes to the wall in 1984, but it was in distress already in 1982, Continental Bank of Illinois fails. Now that at the time was the largest failure, bank failure in US history. And that shook the financial system somewhat. Uh, that said, again, because the economy, un the underlying a real economy was strong and was benefiting from, the from some of the supply side uh, policies of, of the early Reagan administration, um, the economy was able to grow through that. Nevertheless, Reagan's reelected in a landslide. And I believe if you take that three year period that is between when Continental Bank of Illinois fails, uh, the, that three year period, I believe the U.S. economy grew by 16 percent. That's a big number, right? That's like an emerging market number. Uh, and that the US economy was able to do that was a testimony to just how, how, how dynamic the economy still was, notwithstanding this bout of stagflation it went through. Okay, moving forward. Um, arguably the easy money following the stock market crash of 1987, late 1987, led to the SNL bubble, savings and loans. Uh, they then get bailed out with lower interest rates and an outright federal bailout through the Resolution Trust Corporation in the early 1990s. 
Okay, uh, the economy then recovers from that. Uh, you have the tech boom that occurs during the 1990s, eventually gets out of hand in the late 1990s, as we go in the early 2000s, that blows up. Federal Reserve lowers interest rates to the lowest level ever up to that point. And then the housing market bubble grows from that point forward, is totally out of control by 2007, 2008, it all blows up. Here, so you see this, we've gone through this iterative process Every major downturn results in some money being thrown at it, big, big recovery, eventually turns into a bubble, blows up, more money's thrown at it, big, big recovery, eventually turns into a bubble, blows up. For every action, there is an unequal opposite reaction that actually leads to a bigger bubble next time round and a bigger blow up. That's the road we're on, and that's what may also happen again next time round. Any idea of when that would be? I mean, if we look at uh, when here in the U.S. when Obama took over, I mean, he that's when the GFC was really thrown in his lap, right? That big bubble that uh, all those bad decisions um, were dropped in the new president's lap. I mean, could we see something like that again in 2025? Or do you think that they will be able to continue to inflate the bubble, which seems to be happening. They're certainly trying. Uh, right now, the United States is running the largest ever deficit as a percentage of GDP outside of wartime. And, and so what that really means is that the, the, the U.S. government, in particular the federal government, to some extent at the state and local level, is, is, the, is what's really keeping the economy going here. That's why it still feels strong to some people. It certainly doesn't feel strong to everybody. But that deficit, that, that borrowing from the future, as it were, is really what's keeping the economy afloat. Most of the rest of the world is in recession or close to it. So the U.S. is kind of this outlier because of this enormous federal spend outside of wartime running a huge deficit. Uh, and outside of recession, running a huge deficit. So that that's unsustainable. That That's unsustainable. Also, the bubbles that have built up in securities markets and arguably, you know, real estate to some extent, depends on where you are. All, all of that, all of that is subject to, 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 to somehow blowing up at some point. Timing these things can be very difficult. I mean, I, I started to warn uh, Lehman Brothers that the housing market was in trouble in 2006, because that's when I was getting my intel from people on the ground in California, that actually the market had begun to seize up already before the end of 2006. Inventory, the inventory to sales ratio in the California market was starting to rise pretty steeply. It remained high th into 2007, but it was only mid 2007 when the first big crack started to appear in the market and they didn't fully blow things up for another year after that, right, in 2008. So anyway, timing these things can be impossible. All we can say is this. The, it, this is an unstable equilibrium. Uh, call it a house of cards. Call it what you want. And when the cards begin to fall, no one will look at that and say, oh, gee, uh, nobody could have seen that coming. No, they'll all, they'll, they'll all admit at that point that it was a house of cards. But no one knows when that first card is going to be removed. And no one knows which card that is. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at. It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I <laughs> went out to flew out to Washington and uh, Brent Beardle, I had a, uh, I interviewed him. He, he's the CEO of Wafed Bank. Mm. And uh, I, I think my biggest takeaway from that interview was that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They can't, you can't come out and say it's a house of cards because that really escalates the, right. the panic. And we, see that in bank runs when people feel that a bank is insolvent uh, or having problems like we saw on March 12th of 23 uh, right. that weekend when Silicon Valley Bank uh, you know failed I think that was the third largest bank in the history so we quickly responded to that and I think put everyone's uh, fears at ease for now uh, but we also watched regional banks take a big hit and a lot of the money going to your your larger banks the jp morgan chase wells fargo bank of america so when we're talking about the house of cards or things falling down and deteriorating quickly from there i've heard you say that you never see deficit spending like what's going on right now unless you're in a recession but 
we're not seeing the results of the recession. Where will the cracks now turn up? Will we see more bank failures? Will that be publicized or will it just not be covered in mainstream media so that it doesn't become part of this self-fulfilling prophecy of failure? Will we see it in the layoffs? I mean, where, where will the result of the money supply, the, the printing of the money, now that we're seeing a contraction in that, and I want you to explain that, but where, where do you think that we'll see the crack show up? What we've seen uh, uh, through all of these iterations that I referred to a, a few minutes ago, uh, every time you go through one, there is a net centralization of debt and credit risk in the system. Every time there's a bailout, more of that debt and credit risk gets centralized in a, in a shrinking number of major financial institutions and in the government itself, which arguably backstops those major financial institutions implicitly, if not necessarily explicitly. And so the, the place that you look for the cracks actually becomes increasingly looking towards the center. And the ability of the U.S. government to finance itself is something that is now kind of in question because the interest burden, uh, in debt servicing burden, is, is, is soaring exponentially as a result of a combination of higher interest rates and also also a, a sharply rising debt burden, right? The, I forget how many days it took the US to add the last trillion of its debt, but it, was, it wasn't very long. And, and, that, and that is unsustainable. It's asymptotic, right? You look at it and, and you know it's unsustainable. But then some people say, oh, don't worry about it. The government can just force banks to hold its debt. Of course, the Federal Reserve holds, uh, holds federal government debt as a matter of policy, but there are ways to force the banking system to hold the debt too. The problem is, is when you start doing really heavy handed things like that, you start to crowd out capital and that will starve the private sector of capital. And that means you're kind of killing the goose that lays the golden egg. There, there's just no way for the economy to grow properly properly at that point if all you're doing is is, is stuffing you know this this debt uh, through your through all of your monetary transmission channels that is your commercial banking system um, now again you, you the federal government could try to counteract that by just continuing to run deficits ad infinitum but that gets you into a, a foreign financing problem because the U.S. is dependent on foreign financing of its debt issuance to a large degree and in fact some people point to some charts showing that you know, Japan is practically the only large country still acquiring U.S. debt uh, as reserves in large amounts. Russia stopped doing it years ago for you know kind of obvious reasons. China stopped doing it several years ago for reasons that are perhaps not dissimilar, but it's hard to know what the Chinese are up to uh, sometimes. But the fact is, is that the foreign appetite for holding U.S. assets has appeared appears now to have shifted a lot. And so the U.S. is kind of running out of options. Um, it is it's going it's going to run up against this financing wall, and it's not clear how it's going to deal with that. Then, of course, you have the states. Some states are in financial distress. At some point, they might go to the federal government for some sort of bailout. What's going to happen when a big state like California uh, goes to the federal government saying, "Gee, you know, we need some help here"? I mean, that's a huge amount of debt for the government to assume. Uh, but hey, given the politics of things, maybe they would go ahead and do it. I don't know. Um, but that's kind of the way I'll, I'll, I'll finish my answer here is to say that the cracks are moving ever closer to Washington, D.C., New York City, uh, and you know the, where, the, where the power, the monetary, financial, and, and political powers that be reside. You say that we're killing the goose that laid the golden egg. Our largest employer are small businesses. Uh, they collectively make the largest employer and um, and we know that when you're comparing uh, publicly traded businesses to these small operators the small operators will throw their their paycheck in the drawer before you know and, and they'll pay their people before they take their own money and we know the bureaucrats will shut down businesses and locations and um, because they're focusing their primary concern is their own necks and their shareholders so do you think we'll start to see a lack of credit supply for the small businesses i mean do you think that we'll start to see small businesses suffer first from a money contraction and what will that do with our unemployment rates 
Look, uh, look the, the marginal borrower almost always suffers first. It's just that the scale of difference between the marginal borrower's access to credit and, and those who are, are higher quality credits, the, the gap grows ever larger. And, and that's, that's kind of where we're ending up now. Uh, that is, there, there's going to be almost a complete lack of access to credit uh, going forward, in my opinion. Uh, you also have the reality, uh, the unpleasant reality, I should say, that um, commercial real estate, is, is already in a crisis. I, I think that's generally recognized. I don't think anyone real uh, anyone knows just what that implies, just how big it is. But I think everyone knows that's already been going on now. Ever since COVID, people were hoping for a big recovery post COVID. Hasn't really happened, uh, and so that that that's already there. And so if, if the residential market is also poor, uh, that is cre- access to credit for um, for small small medium enterprises. Um, that that's going to be a problem too. I, I think you, you put it, you put it all together, and what concerns me is that if you look at existing, that is the actual bank lending data over the past year, and you adjust it for inflation, commercial and industrial loans. So let, let's leave aside real estate for a moment. Commercial and industrial lending uh, is already outright negative and has been for over half a year. Now you normally only see that in a recession. OK, so th- you, you've already got this distressed small business sector in the United States, as it were, that is either unwilling or unable to borrow. But wh- whichever it is, is pretty bad. That's already going on. Commercial real estate's already in crisis. Residential may end up in crisis, depending on what happens. Um, it's, it just looks grim. I mean, I hate to say it, but but you know, you, you look at the numbers, and and it is not telling you a pretty picture. The big outlier I already mentioned: the federal government is running a huge deficit, given that we're not yet officially in recession and we're not at war. That's really carrying the whole economy. And and people who know how business is done in Washington, I, I spend a little time there myself. If if you think that that's what's carrying the country, you, you should be properly frightened, <laughs> right? Yeah. So do you see where we'll have an explosion in unemployment? Uh, The thing is, the jobs market's a lagging indicator. And just about everything else goes wrong, uh, even in a typical business cycle, much less something that's unusually large, say. Uh, The jobs market is the last thing to really show you that things are bad. That said, if you look behind the headline jobs numbers (laughs) in the U.S., they already look bad because you see three three worrying trends. Number one, private sector jobs growth is very weak compared to public sector jobs growth. That has a lot to do with the fact that the government is spending so much money, right? A lot of that goes into hiring. Okay, but other factors equal private sector jobs tend to be more productive than public sector jobs. And of course, keep in mind, only private sector jobs create tax revenue for the government. Public sector jobs don't. So that's a, that's a worrying trend. The other worrying trend is when it comes to full-time jobs, most of the growth has been in relatively low productivity industries. Um, healthcare. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are very high productivity parts of healthcare, but a lot of it is just sort of basic maintenance called like almost nursing work, right? Which is not particularly high productivity. It's essential. I'm, I'm not downplaying the importance of it for a second, but it's not an area where you see high rates of productivity growth normally. And then leisure, hospitality, tourism, things like that, which again are, are, you know, they can provide nice jobs and who who doesn't want access to leisure, hospitality and travel, Um, but they don't tend to be where you see lots of productivity growth. And finally, most of the jobs growth, in fact, all of the jobs growth, depending on how you read the data over the past year, has been in part-time jobs, not full-time jobs. So these are three very worrying trends that when you look behind the headlines, tell you that something is deeply, deeply wrong with the U.S. economy already. And if another straw lands on the camel's back, then yes, the headline numbers will start to show you that. We're just not there yet. When you say that government jobs aren't as productive as private sector jobs, Specifically, what are you referring to? Right. There are ways in which economists measure uh, productivity per worker, output per worker, and things like that. And the, the nature of government jobs tends to be, uh, it tends to be very service-oriented, uh, that is clerical-oriented, 
it, ten, it and it tends to be very sort of uh, tied up in in legals and regulations and these sorts of things. Now, again, don't get me wrong. Every society needs laws. Every society needs regulations. Every society, you know, to, to some extent, right? Um, but those tend to be, while necessary, they tend not to be where productivity increases. Where you see, where you see productivity really increase is in places where you get a lot of leverage, where you get you know, a handful of workers on an assembly line, and then the assembly line is somehow improved, and all of a sudden. Every single worker on that assembly line is suddenly more productive, okay? Or you invent a faster computer chip that can process more information in less time, and everybody who's processing information for any job is suddenly more productive than they were. That's where the productivity growth is, where you get those types of leverage. Uh, as a general rule, you know, legislation, regulation, pushing paper around um, – uh, and, and services generally, be they, I, I'll just throw out a few examples, again, not to disparage these industries, but, you know, hairdressing. You, you're just not going to see big productivity advances in hairdressing or nail filing or, or manic, manicures, right? You, you see what I'm getting at? Um, and so that's, that's a big part of the explanation right there. And the private sector relies on profit. <laughs> so, well, that's the, that's the motivation. Profit, right? That's right. the motivation, right? right. And, and so this is why it's so distressing that commercial and industrial loan growth adjusted for inflation has been outright negative for over half a year. Because if businesses saw potential profit out there, they would be investing to get as much out of it as possible. But they're not doing that. Businesses don't see how in the current environment to grow their profitability. So why are they even going to try? They won't. They're going to wait and see until conditions improve. Yeah. But the road we're on is not a road towards improving conditions right now. Yeah, now's not the time for risk for them. I mean, they're no. in their survival mode. And that's what we're right. starting to see where you know local operators, they're getting rid of people that they are afraid that will take profits that will put them under and we're seeing it and you know let's go back to commercial real estate where do you think i mean the obvious elephant in the room is office space and i've been in real, commercial real estate for quite some time and i can remember prior to covid i was at a convention in uh, nashville tennessee it was building owners and managers association boma is the acronym and they had their IoT Internet of Things conference. And they were already talking about the next round of automation. Uh, you know, office space requirements were being reduced. The WeWork or co-working space was this big phenomenon that was going in and um, wholesale leasing, essentially parts of buildings or whole buildings and turning them into a, a shared workspace. Then we watched what happened the pandemic so businesses were already starting their office consolidations they were already starting to look at why don't we just use 1099 contractors you know independent contractors for a lot of the jobs that we have these very expensive w-2 employees it's the largest expense on their uh, financial statement in a lot of industries their labor markets and then when you couple uh, insurance requirements uh, they uh, days off and they you know, increasing every year, you know, with uh, required days off and and just employee expenses. This was happening beforehand. So now we're looking at a lot of these buildings are empty. They're sitting there vacant. They don't qualify for refinance uh, with their lender, their bank. But yet banks hold on average. I've been told you can correct me if I'm wrong. About seventy percent of their balance sheet is in commercial real estate. When I met with Brent at Wafed, he said that it really isn't as bad as what we're hearing, that uh, you know, the hotel sectors are doing great and the retail sectors are doing great and restaurants. But I'm seeing the exact opposite of that here locally in Maryland where we operate. I'm seeing restaurants empty, retail stores empty. I mean, I was at about five miles away a big shopping district in Towson on a weeknight I mean the places are dead they're empty I don't know how they're paying their bills what do you see playing out here what sectors do you think would be hit the most and how would these regional banks handle this commercial 
building debt? Look, I hate to say this, and again, I'm not an expert on commercial real estate. Absolutely not. However, I do have a sense of how banks work. And you're quite right to point out just how heavy bank balance sheets are with commercial real estate. Of course, they're that heavy because they're st- they haven't marked this stuff down yet, right? It's, it, again, it's, it's a market that is not particularly liquid necessarily. And that li- to the extent it is liquid, that liquidity is directional. You're going to see much higher transactions volumes in a rising price environment than in a declining price environment. And that, what that means is if prices are declining, and people seem to think they must be, I mean, we have seen a few high profile sales recently. Um, the fact is, oh, the quality of the information is low. You just don't have the same volume and it's more difficult to make uh, uh, a, a good assessment. And of course, the US is a big country. What's happening in one region may not correspond to what's happening in another. There'll, there'll almost certainly be some overlap, uh, but there'll be some variation. But you're quite right to, 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 to use your own anecdotal experience uh, as a contrast to what some of the big headline figures are. Be- because when you do see that, it doesn't mean that your anecdotal experience is indeed right, but it does mean that there, you, there's, if there is a difference, it should be investigated. Leave it at that, right? And when you start to investigate it, what you see is that historically, banks are very, very slow to realize losses uh, that they are allowed through a county convention to carry forward for long periods of time. That's just the way it's done. Banks have all, what is a bank? A bank is a balance sheet. A bank is a highly leveraged balance sheet. And in some cases, that highly leveraged balance sheet is full of stuff that's very, very illiquid, but for regulatory reasons does not need to be marked to market. And therefore, they can just keep kicking the accounting can down the road for very long periods of time. Now, that can, ultimately, that becomes a very dangerous game to play because people smell trouble. You've got a lot of debt to roll over. You eventually go to the wall. This happens very quickly with Silicon Valley Bank, but that was a bit of an exception uh, to the way these things normally play out. But there is an elephant in the room. There is an elephant in the room. And it is big. It's probably the the biggest commercial real estate elephant there's ever been. And this is going to take a long time to work out. However, and this is the nature of real estate, commercial, uh, uh, residential, it doesn't matter. When you do have a high profile sale and a specific, on a specific street, in a specific town, in a specific city, district, state, county, state, district, whatever, you know, go on and on. Just keep, just keep getting larger. It becomes harder and harder and harder for the market to deny what the net repricing of every property on that street, every property on that town, every property in that city, so on and so forth. They kind of all have to be marked. If that's the only price that's observable is that one transaction that happened to go through, you've just repriced the whole market. Um, and, and that can cause a sudden distressed situation when the people who backstop the banking, backstop the lenders, as it were, decide that they want their money back, right? That they're not going to play this game anymore. They're not going to roll over that that financing anymore. They just want to cut their losses and run. And, and, and then, then you get things unfolding rapidly. That's kind of what played out in 2007 and uh, into 2008. How do the banks handle that? So if we have a scenario where a bank, you know, a bank has a a note, a loan on a building, let's just say it's $20 million for simple uh, math. And it's up for refinance and commercial loans, maybe it's five years, we're not seeing 10 year loans anymore. Uh, Banks don't want to commit because the interest rates have been so low. But let's just say it's up for refinance. And financially, it's it's non conforming to what the federal government requires the bank to you know, as far as debt to income ratio or the asset to income ratio uh, for refinance. And they go to the owner and they say, look, your loan is due for renewal. Your building is worth $10 million, not $20 million, or we're comfortable lending you $10 million, not that $20 million loan balance. And you need to bring $10 million to the table to refinance. Now we do that on a major scale. The building owner doesn't have the $10 million. What will they do? I mean, right now what we're seeing 
is the banks are just extending the note. They're giving them a 90 or 120 day extension, maybe more. I don't, but I know of 90 and 120 day extensions to prevent this from coming back on them right. to be a, an asset that the bank doesn't want that's worth maybe 10 cents or 50 cents on the dollar at best. How does the bank handle that? Do you see where the government will come in and allow them to continue to bankroll these? Will they, how, how will a bank handle that? Well, certainly the political pressure grows as more and more banks end up in this situation. And, and eventually they will go to their regional Federal Reserve or the big ones, of course, will go to the New York Fed uh, and, and they'll start to explain the scale of the problem. And, that, and that's when that's when things get serious. And, and again, this is what was going on in 2007 and into 2008, long before Lehman Brothers blew up. Uh, there are all sorts of discussions taking place. We 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 do know we do know some of the specifics now regarding uh, how the deal to uh, get J.P. Morgan to gobble up Bear Stearns' bad debt was done. Right. We we've we've read all the dramas now about Lehman Brothers. That's been thoroughly investigated. We kind of know how that played out. Obviously, this is a slightly different animal, and yet there, there are going to be a lot of similarities. And eventually, you're you're going to get the attention of the regulators and. Again, it, it it will then come down to politics. Um, the 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 major financial institutions pushing for some sort of bailout because it will it will come to that. They will basically present the Federal Reserve slash Treasury with an ultimatum of sorts that goes along the lines of, "Look, uh, we didn't want to end up here, but here we are. Uh, there is going to be a fire sale if we don't get ahead of this now. We need to build a fire break, as it were." or this thing is going to rage out of control and it will throw the economy uh, in general into a tailspin. So um, here is our suggested uh, means of doing this. Um, it's up to you to find a way to sell this politically to you know, the Congress and the people at large. Um, so, you know, get to work. You've probably got only a, you know, a few weeks to sort this out. Um, the alternative is we're going to start selling because that's just what we have to do. It, it's I hate to say this, but I mean that it, I think it will come to something like that. Exactly what it looks like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I respect your experience, and you're probably right. Before we before we end, I want to talk about the money supply a little bit, um, and and there's a chart that I want to pull up here and get your opinion on. Um, maybe you could explain this. A lot of people, and, and I include myself in this, uh, I, I'm just not familiar with the, the M supply. You know, have M1, M2, M3, M4 uh, supply. <laughs> and I don't know that the Fed pays much attention to, to money supply when they're uh, trying to figure things out. But this M2, can you tell everybody why is there – amongst most economists and financial analysts, why is the M2 supply so important and what is it? And and then we'll kind of get you to explain this chart as to the percentage of change, year over year change in the M2 supply and how that is so drastic. You know, we've it's been at the highest peak recently and the lowest valley just kind of can you just explain what all this means well i mean that that huge swing that you see over the past few years right that is all the excess liquidity that was created by the federal reserve to uh, basically try to keep the financial system stable and liquid during the covid lockdowns as well as to make it easy as easy as possible for the federal government to finance emergency uh, payments and whatnot and lending uh, uh, during the uh, financial uh during, during excuse me during the covid crisis and and as you can see that's been taken away now um but you know, that aside what you do see uh i mean if you take a look at the uh, the the the, the y-axis there you do see an average growth rate of M2 year over year of between five and ten percent, as being, you know, say, normal uh, through the decades, as it were. Um, okay, so why M2? Well, first of all, let's start with the base M0. M0 is basically not even money in the way we think about it. M0 are just computer entries from the Federal Reserve that enable commercial banks to lend if they choose to do so. So it's call it potential money not real money. It's money that could be loaned into existence, but only if loans are originated. Okay, that's M0. 
M1 is the closest aggregate we have to actual money. It includes physical cash, notes and coins, and it includes instant demand deposits. That is deposits which you can spend immediately electronically or th by using an old fashioned uh, check that you, that, you, that you hand to someone. So M1 is the closest thing we have to what most of us consider to be instantly spendable money. M2 sits above that and it, it includes short time deposits. Now, the reason why it includes short time deposits is because that is money that is not immediately spendable, but it will become spendable on a very short time horizon. So you can kind of assume that it's likely to be spent on a fairly short time horizon. It's not it's not meant to be a long-term savings vehicle. So it's still, it's very, very important when, uh, when trying to gauge how much uh, liquidity there is in the system. Now, by the time you get to M3, which is even a, a broader aggregate than M2, the Fed doesn't even bother to count it anymore because it includes so many sources of liquidity. Um, it's not clear what purposes that liquidity is meant to serve, whether it will ever be spent or wh whether it will just be permanently sitting in some form of savings account. So that's why a lot of people focus on M2. Um, look, what can you say? The, the crazy volatility that we saw once again is over now. That was all COVID related. But this 5 to 10% sort of average growth rate that we've seen, even that uh, is something that ultimately you have to kind of scratch your head about a little bit because that is chronically higher than the rate of economic growth and chronically higher than the average rate of inflation over the period. There's a famous economist at Stanford called John Taylor, and he came up with a simple rule, which took a look at inflation and it took a look at the growth rate and kind of back of the envelopes, what Fed interest rate policy should be. And if you take a look at what's actually happened with Fed policy, it's been chronically too loose and it's allowed asset bubbles to grow and then bust, grow and then bust. And it's also been part of the reason why inflation soared to the extent it has over the past couple of years. Although, yes, there were supply side factors. Those factors would not have been anywhere near as generally priced inflationary if there was not all this excess liquidity sloshing around the system when we went into the COVID lockdown. So that's what the chart is sort of telling you. Um, but there are different types of monetary aggregates. And I personally do not think that M2 has the closest relationship with the business cycle. In my opinion, M1 is better uh, and indeed, if you make a couple small adjustments to M1, this is getting a little bit wonk-ish now, but if you make a couple little adjustments to M1, you can make it even better. And guess what? Uh, M1, including with those adjustments, has been outright contracting quite severely now for some time. That's probably one of the best expl explanations uh, for why commercial and industrial loan growth, inflation adjusted, has been outright negative. All of these private sector indicators tell you that the private sector in the United States is already in recession. It's only the public sector that's keeping the broader economy going at this point. Hmm. Interesting. So when we hear of contraction, and I spoke with a professor uh, last week where he had said that there has only been four times in the history of the U.S. where we had money contract and uh one of them led to the, the Great Depression. But now we're having this occurrence the fifth time here in the U.S. of contraction of money supply. How does that contract? I mean, are we talking about the fact that people just no longer have money in their bank accounts? I mean, that is it the deficit spending of consumers? I mean, how are they gauging the contraction of the money? Well, money supply grows or contracts based on a combination of push factors and pull factors. A business that wants to borrow, that's a pull factor. But the Fed creating excess reserves, making uh, more lending capability available to the banks, that, that is a push factor. But ultimately, you can lead a horse to water and you can push all you want, but you can't make the horse drink. You cannot force the private sector to borrow and spend and invest. You can, however, throw as much liquidity as you want through the financial system. But you need you, you need both the push and the pull to really get money growing. But the pull factor 
uh, back from the Fed, that is removing the push and literally pulling the horse away from the water, almost never happens. As you've pointed out, that's very rare. And on those rare occasions it has happened, it's either led to a recession or a financial crisis or both. So the Fed may think they can do things different this time. Uh, the financial markets may trust the Fed that they can somehow do things different this time. But history suggests that where we're currently at is a very dangerous time indeed. Well, we appreciate all your insight to this. Any final thoughts on what should people be doing? Should, you know, ordinary people, should they, uh, should they be concerned about their money in the bank? Should they be doing specific things for investment purposes? I mean, what, what, what should they do? Well, I certainly hope it doesn't get to the point where people are concerned about bank deposits. I mean, if, if we get to the point where people don't even think bank deposits are, are safe, uh, that's, that's bad. And, and we, should, we should have another conversation at that point because it will have a very different tone. Uh, but what I would do is this. I, I would accept the fact that the financial markets today are not the ones you were taught about in school. That They are very, very different. The bond market is no longer a free market in long-term savings, okay? It's just not. It is now a means whereby the U.S. federal government finances chronic deficits that I don't see how they're ever going to go away. And so, and the Federal Reserve enables that on average with easy money. That is a net inflationary policy that the bond market is not going to protect you from. The stock market may be in a bubble in parts, but in other parts less so. If you take a look at some basic industries, they're trading at valuations that are not wildly out of line with historical averages. A lot of these basic industries are, they're boring. Uh, and they're mature, so they don't have a lot of growth potential, but they're profitable. They make money and they pay dividends. And the good news is, if we're going to be mired in a somewhat inflationary environment for some time, because of chronically inflationary fiscal and monetary policy, at least these corporate earnings uh, will continue to grow with inflation. So you could argue they're somewhat inflation protected. Uh, and I think it's very unlikely that some of the, these larger basic industries are, 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 are going to go bankrupt. I mean, they, they might struggle in a recession, of course, who wouldn't? But, but it's not as if they're going to just be erased from the map. So my current advice to investors is, look, everyone might need to own some bonds, but understand bonds today are not what bonds used to be. And if you are in the stock market, consider getting into relatively low risk, mature, less dynamic industries that have good cash flow, good profits, and that, and that those profits and dividends will grow with inflation if inflation remains in the system long term. I also recommend uh, that people buy other uh, or have some exposure to real assets. Uh, that can be property. If you if you own property in what appears to be a non-bubble uh, you know, area, say, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Uh, and, I, and I also think that uh, everyone should own some portion of their liquid net worth. Uh, in gold. Uh, it's a great way to diversify a portfolio. Um, I've run the numbers on this for over a century. The fact is, is that you always want to have at least a small allocation to gold. And when you get into situations like we're in today, you actually want to have a, a, a quite sizable uh, allocation to gold. That is one that's probably in a double digit percentage rather than merely a single digit percentage. Um, those are just some, some big macro asset allocation thoughts that I'll throw out there. Yeah, well, thanks so much, John. We really appreciate your expertise and your advice. And uh, hopefully we'll get to check in with you again soon. Oh, yeah, I hope so. Thanks, Todd. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the interview, hit that thumbs up and I'll let John and I know that you did. And as always, if you haven't subscribed to Saks Realty's YouTube channel, consider doing so now. Hit that alert bell. You'll know every time we upload content just like this. And one of the ways that you could help this video get out to more people is hitting that share button. Share it with your family and friends because information like this you won't hear in mainstream media. See you next time. Saks Realty, Maryland Broker, number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.